We've been going through a lot of uh, Scripture uh, and, and going through it very quickly, so I really want you to know we're going to zero in on a small portion tonight. Well, small for what I've been going through. But we're going to take a look at uh, Zechariah chapter 14. Please turn there uh, right now. And as you're turning, let me say the Bible teaches us that Nimrod had a kingdom. And we saw the last few weeks that not only did he have a kingdom, but he had, he had the, a literal kingdom. It was a land and a property. We found that in the book of Micah uh, 5, 6, that uh, he had a kingdom. And not only he had a kingdom, but beloved, he had a religion. And he had a one world government, and he had a one world religion, and he had a one world economy. He had everything that we as latter-day Christians know of is going to be like the tribulation period. So he was a forerunner. I don't believe Nimrod's going to come back as the Antichrist. I don't believe that one iota. I believe Nimrod is dead, and I believe Nimrod is more than likely in hell, as the Bible would say. But what we need to understand as Nimrod progressed his kingdom, and you know, we, we lose track of Nimrod as soon as the, the Babel experience. But there's a lot of historical factors. Sometimes the names change, folks. And a lot of historical factors through the Jewish writings, such as Josephus, and through some of the other Jewish writings, and through Jewish commentaries, and through many other, other areas, we find that Nimrod survived and lived for a long time and was alive during the time of Abraham. We talked about that, how God brought Abraham out of the Nimrod factor, out of the Nimrod code, and brought him back to the God of Noah. And we saw that when, when the children of Israel had gone down into Egypt, they went back into captivity, into slavery. Some of them went back into the Nimrod type of religion. Again, God rose a man up. Moses got him out of there. And then we saw how the children of Israel, once they got back into the land of Canaan, got back into the idol worship, got back into the Nimrod style religion, got back into the Nimrod code, and God took them to Babylon, there to punish them for 70 years. When they came back, the Nimrod code still existed in the Greek Empire, and in also in the Syrian, and also in the Roman Empire. But Christianity came on the scene through Jesus, and Jesus, the Son of God, brought us an opportunity that we might know God and take us out of this pagan world, literally, one day, but religiously today that we might worship God in spirit and in truth. Amen. However, the Nimrod Code went underground and has existed ever since then. And one day will rear its head back up in the last days as we see during the tribulation period. However, the Bible tells us that the Nimrod kingdom will come to an end. How is that? Well, in Daniel chapter 2, verse four, uh, 34 and 35, it says, you remember we talked about this, the second message? You watch while a stone was cut out without hands, which struck the image and its feet of iron and clay and broke them in pieces. Then the iron, the clay, and the bronze, and the silver, and the gold were crushed together and became like chaff from the summer threshing floors. The wind carried them away so that no trace of them were found. And the stone that struck the image became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. Now, remember we talked about that and how that's a picture of Jesus coming back at the conclusion of the Nimrod Code, when all this is fulfilled, and once more we have a one-world government, a one-world religion, and a one-world leader. And Jesus is going to come back, what I call the Stone Kingdom, or a lot of Bible students call the Stone Kingdom. And the Stone Kingdom is going to have a direct confrontation with what I call the Brick Kingdom. Remember, we talked about how Nimrod made bricks. He took the clay and he baked them. He just didn't let them sun dry. He baked them so they would be waterproofed. And he used slime so that he could, what the King James Version calls slime, so that he could waterproof between the bricks. Saying to the people, I'm going to protect you in this tall tower so if God wants to judge us once more with a flood, I'll have protection for you. And so Nimrod became a substitute for God in these people's eyes and literally his kingdom was a kingdom in direct opposition to God. 
The stone kingdom is going to come, as Daniel says, and he's going to smash all these kingdoms that were literally a part of this Nimrod code. Speaking of the Babylonian kingdom, which was basically a kingdom started by Nimrod. Then you have the, the Medo-Persian empire. Then you have the, uh, the Greek empire. Then you have the Roman empire. Then you have the revived Roman empire. We saw all of this in Daniel. The stone kingdom is going to come in direct confrontation with this brick kingdom of Nimrod. Let's turn our Bibles now to Zechariah 14. And as a way of introduction, I want you to look at the first three verses. First three verses of Zechariah 14. Behold, the day of the Lord is coming, and your spoil will be divided in your midst. For I will gather all the nations to battle against Jerusalem. The city shall be taken, the houses rifled, and the women ravished. Half of the city shall go into captivity, but the remnant of the people shall not be cut off from the city. Then the Lord will go forth and fight against these nations as he fights in the day of battle. And we see here in these first three verses three things. Really, it's, it's a simple outline of the tribulation period. In verse 1, we see the time of Jacob's trouble. He say, he's writing to the Jewish people here. And he says to the Jewish people, Behold, the day of the Lord is coming, and your spoils will be divided in your midst. The day of the Lord, that's the last days. That is the latter days. That is the tribulation period. The Bible says in that day, Israel is going to be spoiled, so to speak. Meaning someone's going to take and, and try to uh, do away with Israel. So we see in verse 1, the time of Jacob's trouble. And that's an interesting title for the tribulation period. It's called the last days. It's called uh, a, t a terrible time. There's a lot of titles. If we had time, we could go through all of them. But one of the most interesting ones is the time of Jacob's trouble. The Lord is going to take the Jewish people through this time. As Enoch was, was translated with God before the flood, and Noah was protected and taken through the flood, so will the Christian, the church, be taken out of this time so that we will not go through the tribulation, but the Jewish people will go through it but be protected by God. We see here a time of Jacob's trouble. Look at verse 2. There's a battle for Jerusalem, and that's the mid-tribulation. For I will gather all the nations to battle against Jerusalem. You say, well, that sounds like the, the uh, uh, Battle of Armageddon. We're going to see that in, in verse 3. But the Battle of Armageddon is a series of battles, and it concludes there in the Valley of Jehoshaphat, or the Valley of, of Armageddon. And there the battle will be fought. But look at verse 2. The Bible says, For I will gather all the nations to battle against Jerusalem. The city shall be taken. That's not happening in, in, the, in the battle of Armageddon, the last battle. Now, the, the city will be taken, the houses rifled, the women's uh, ravished, and all the cities shall go into captivity, but the remnant of people shall not be cut off from the city. That remnant, by the way, will go down to Petra. You know what I find very interesting about Petra? I got on and Googled Petra and was looking around. Do you know that right across the way from Elat, which is the southernmost city of Jerusalem, if I were left behind, I would believe that it would be important for me to get to that city because you can go right across the border right there. It's just like going across over to the other side of Tifton. It's that close. And right on the other side there in Jordan, they have built a brand new airport, an international airport in the desert. There are no huge cities nearby. Nothing around there, but it's an international airport. Right there, Google it, you can see it. Go, go look for Elat and just go to the, a little bit to the east and you'll see the King Hussein International Airport. They have built, built more. When I first went to, to Petra, there was nothing there but maybe one hotel. And that was kind of like when Indiana Jones was there, you know, you knew. That <laughs> it, was a, it was a bad hotel, but anyway... There's all kinds of hotels there now. Water has been brought there. There's been all kinds of... They have built up Petra for a group of people to go in there one day. But anyway, that's off the topic. Verse 3, we see the Battle of Armageddon. And that's the end of the tribulation period, three and a half years after the Battle of Jerusalem. Then the Lord will go forth and fight against those nations as He fights in the day of battle. Jesus is going to come back. 
And folks, it's not going to be the lowly carpenter. It's not going to be the, the, the son of God who comes and, and brings peace like a lamb. But this is going to be the lion of Judah. Amen. And he's going to come and he's going to attack these people. And he's going to destroy them. And we're going to see how. This is what I call the clash of the two kingdoms. The kingdom of this world, or the kingdoms of this world, unified into what the Nimrod factor, or the Nimrod code was all about back then. And Satan's going to bring this kingdom to come in direct conflict and clash there in the valley of Jezreel, or the, the, the battle of Armageddon. And we're going to see what happens. I originally was going to go into the 19th chapter of Revelation, but God didn't want me to do that. I got down and relaxing in Florida and I was enjoying myself and thinking, oh, this is nice and relaxing myself. And the Lord, I said, I'll just read over this a little bit. And the Lord says, nope, this is not what you're going to do. You're going to go to Zechariah. I said, okay. And I wasn't a literal voice. I don't hear voices. <laughs> I, I, generally, I don't. Well, usually I don't, but anyway. God said, go to this because this is going to show us as if we were transported to that day to be right there in the valley of Jezreel. I've been there at Megiddo. You can go to Megiddo. There's a beautiful place there. It's an oasis. It looks like all kinds of beautiful things. It's a, it's a mound, a tell, so to speak, that they have built several uh, towns, several cities upon it. And, and the archaeologists have cut out like a pie right out of that, that tell, that mound. And there in that, that pie cutting, you can see all the different layers of all the different civilizations and all the different cities. And it goes all the way down to the Canaanite civilization. And there is a huge altar where they had human sacrifice right there. And you can look down in that. But what the most interesting thing, as you were looking down at that altar, you look up and you see this vast, beautiful, green, lush valley. Beautiful place. Many battles, you wouldn't think that all the battles were fought there, but there were many battles fought there. Napoleon fought there. The Egyptians fought there. There are many, many battles. The Syrians fought there. Many, many battles fought there. You wouldn't know that by looking at that. Even in modern times when Israel was struggling with their independence, there were battles fought there. But one day there's going to come a battle that will end all battles, and we're going to see that today. Let's take a look here in, in Zechariah chapter 14. We're going to see, first of all, the first phase of Armageddon. In the 14th uh, ver chapter and in verse 4 and 5, we see the coming of the Lord. And in that day, what day is that? Look back at verse 3. Then the Lord will go forth and fight against those nations as he fights in the day of battle. And in that day, his feet will stand on the Mount of Olives, which faces Jerusalem. On the east, and the Mount of Olives shall be split in two from east to west, making a very large valley. Half of the mountain shall move toward the north, and, the ha and half of it toward the south. Then you shall flee through my mountain valley. He's talking to the Jewish people. For the mountain valley shall reach to Azal. Yes, you shall flee. As you fled from the earthquake in the days of Uzziah, the king of Judah, Thus the Lord my God will come and all the saints with you. What we see here in verse 4 is the entrance of Christ into this world. Right now, Jesus, he's omnipresent. And how can he be that way? He's that way through the Holy Spirit. You know you have the Holy Spirit in you. Each and every one of you are born again Christian. The book of Romans says if you do not possess the Spirit of God, you are none of his. And so he's omnipresent in the aspect that he knows all things through the power and the recognition of the Holy Spirit. However, he is seated right now, today, at the right hand of the Father, interceding for us. He's our advocate. And when Satan goes to, to uh, uh, accuse us, accuse the brethren before God, we have a Savior who is there as an advocate, speaking for us, saying, Father, that sin I carried to the cross. That sin was the third ring on the hammer. That sin was the third time that I heard that clash of that hammer hitting that nail in my feet. That was that sin. The stabbing of my, my side, that's the sin that I died for. The thirst that I felt, it was that sin I died for. Folks, 
Jesus is there right now interceding for us. When the devil comes and says, you call him a Christian? You call her a Christian? And Jesus says, that's my child. And he intercedes for us. But one day, he's going to stand. And the Bible says in Revelation 19, he's going to mount that white horse. And he's going to come back to do battle. And folks, we're coming with him. I tell everybody, I don't care if you can't afford a horse. If you can't ride, learn to ride, because you're going to ride a horse. Preacher, I've never rode a horse. Go down to the Walmart in that quarter and get on that horse. And ride that horse all day long so you'll learn to ride, because folks, we're going to ride back with Jesus. Amen. Look again at verse 4 and 5. The Bible says in verse 4, And on that day his feet will stand on the Mount of Olives. That's his place of invasion, folks. That's literal. That's not some allegory. That's not some symbolism. That foot is going to come right there and hit that mountain. Now, I'll tell you, if you go to Jerusalem today, they'll take you up to this little cupola or copula on top of the mountain, and they'll take you and show you a rock. And there that guide will look at you and say, now you see that footprint in that rock? That's Jesus' rock when he ascended into heaven. Hey, I got a bridge I want to sell you too, you know. The bottom line is these people know that Jesus ascended from heaven or from earth into heaven from the Mount of Olives. We know that from the book of Acts, do we not? In Acts chapter 1 and verse 11, it's a place of prophecy. Remember, the disciples are gawking. Their mouth has to be dropped open as they watch Jesus ascending into heaven. And the angels return to them and say, Men of Galilee, why do you stand gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus who was taken up from you into heaven will so come in like manner as you saw him go into heaven. Why is it going to surprise us that he comes to the Mount of Olives? I've been there. It's a beautiful place. You can hit that place and you look right all over that whole city. Also, it was not only a very beautiful place, but it was a very religious place. It was the place where the high priest once a year would take the red heifer up on the Mount Olive area and so that the heifer could look down into the temple would sacrifice that red heifer in the face of the, of the temple so that he could have forgiveness of his sins and they could have the ashes of the red heifer so he could go into the Holy of Holies once a year to atone for the sins of the Israeli people. Folks, Jesus is going to come back, not only as a king, but as our priest, our high priest. And he's going to come back in that same place, the place of his invasion. But look at the power of his impact. There's going to be something different. There's not going to be a little rock with a footprint in it this time. Jesus' foot's going to touch that ground. The Bible says that mountain boom, is going to split right in half, going to the north and to the south. There's going to be something mighty significant about it in just a moment. There are many commentators that I read said, you know, this is the same valley where Jesus is going to judge the nations. When we have the sheep and the goat judgment there in Matthew, when it talks about Jesus gathering the nations, anytime you see that word nations in your Bible, you can substitute the word Gentiles. And he's going to take the Gentiles down into that valley and he's going to judge them. He's going to separate them as sheep and goat. And this is going to be not only a valley of, of, uh, of his landing place, but it's going to be a valley of judgment. Understand that. It's a very important place. We see the power of his impact. In verse 5, look at the escapes of those captives. There are going to be people in Jerusalem who have been left behind there. A large amount of, of, of Jewish people are going to go to Petra. Probably, I guess, if we use the same population today, I was using one of the other scriptures, and they said about a, about a third, maybe a quarter of the Jewish people were going to be able to escape. That's close to two million people. You say, preacher, that's a lot of people. How in the world could that happen? Where could they go in the wilderness? How could, they, how could God sustain two million people? Yeah. Folks, he's already done it. Yes, he has. In the wilderness, right. when they came out of Egypt, close to two million people. You don't think God could do it again? Right. He's going to take two million people down there into that place called Petra, and he's going to feed them for three and a half years. He's going to give them water for three and a half years, and all they got to do is go out and pick it up off the ground if he wants to give them manna again. All they got to do is speak to a rock and it's going to bring water forth. You know, there's, right there by Petra is the spring of Moses where Moses supposedly struck the rock. You can go down that water. It's cold and fresh and comes right out of a rock. It's beautiful. 
But that's a gorgeous, gorgeous place for them to be. But they're going to be there and God's going to protect them, the Bible says. But here we see the group that's been left behind or in Jerusalem. Then you shall flee through my mountain valley. They're going to come out of Jerusalem and run through that valley. For the mountain valley shall reach to Azale. Now, every commentator I ever looked at, every person I ever researched, that's an unknown city. No one knows really where, where it was at. Jesus knows because he basically told them right here, all the way to Azale. It might be some city down about 30 feet underground. Nobody knows. You know, you go over to Israel, seriously now, if you go there to look at some of the places, they'll take you down 20, 30 feet underground and let you see the places where Jesus walked. Now, some of them are on top of the ground, but a lot of them are underground, way underground. But folks, this might be way underground. So the word of God is still true in this aspect. It says here, and, and for the mountain valley shall reach to Azale. Yes, you shall flee as you fled from the earthquake in the days of Uzziah, king of Judah. Now, Uzziah, the king, who made an intrusion into the temple, making himself a priest, and God judged him with a great earthquake, and many people died, because as a king, he had no right to be a priest. As Saul tried to be the priest one time, remember? Remember? And Samuel brought the judgment of God upon him because he was going to try to be a king and a prophet and a priest. Now, folks, there's only one. Only one that can be a prophet, a priest, and a king. There was only one that's called the office of the Messiah, the prophet, the priest, and the king. And those people who tried to be the prophet, the priest, or the king were judged by God, and Uzziah was judged. But the earthquake, the people ran out of Jerusalem. And he says, in that, just like that day, you're going to run out and you're going to go to this place. We see it's a time to flee, but it's a time of favor because God's going to protect them there. For the world, for the, for the world it's going to be a place of judgment. But for the Jewish people, it's going to be a place of safety and, and escape. We see in verse 6 to 11, the conquest of the land. Look at verse 6 through 8, the impact. And it came to pass in that day that there will be no light. The lights will diminish. It shall be one day which is known to the Lord, neither day nor night, but as an evening time it shall happen that it will be light. And in that day it shall be that living waters shall flow from Jerusalem, half of them toward the eastern sea. Now the eastern sea is the Dead Sea. It's called Dead Sea because nothing goes out right now. At one time, I believe that it did. I believe when the Bible says that when Lot and Abraham looked over the well-watered plains and he looked down there and saw Sodom and Gomorrah and Lot said, that's where I want to go, I believe there was an outlet that went all the way down to, to um, uh, Aqaba, which is in Jordan, and Elot, which is in Israel. If you get on Google Earth, you're going to see what I'm going to tell you. If you look at the, the terrain and look at the geography, you can see that. You can see that. But when God destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah, he cut that off and it became a desert place. It, didn't, it wasn't a well-watered plain. It is now, by the way. If you'll go there, they're growing crops down there by the Dead Sea. It's amazing. Irrigation. But we see here that when God makes this happen, the Bible says that suddenly there is no light other than the light of God. That Jesus is going to bring the light. Just like in the beginning... Do you know that I've been preaching in the book of Genesis at home and God gave light before the sun and the moon were, were made? You say, how in the world can that happen? God, duh. <laughs> you know, we have a God that can do that. Right. We have a God that can make that light. And this is going to have a special, very, very holy, significant light so the whole world can know this is God. This is the creator. All these silly atheists and, and, and evolutionists who believe that it took millions and billions of years for that little thing to jump out of the water and become a human being, they're going to be surprised, aren't they? I told your pastor the other day, you know, I was reading as I was doing my research for Genesis. And you know what they say, a, what the atheists say a hiccup is all about? Oh, I, this was deep. This was really deep. I, I had to read that article. I said, boy, I've got to read it. The atheists and, and, the, and the evolutionists believe that we hiccup, and that hiccup is what happened when that first fish with his fins pulled himself out of the water. You know, 
I don't know what possessed that, that turkey to do that, you know. Gee, I can't breathe up there. Let me try and see. But he had a hiccup, and that caused his lungs to kick in and his gills to, to die off. And so that's when we hiccup, we're just doing what our little polywog ancestor did a long time ago, just a hiccup. So I was hiccuping up, hiccuping today and told him, I said, well, I guess that's my ancestor coming out of me. Who knows? But anyway, that don't stop me from eating fish. Amen. Verse 6, we see that impact on the land. It's an astronomical marvel. A light without the sun, the use of the sun. I mean, what's going to happen? I don't know, but I believe it's going to happen. Look at the supremacy of Christ. They're going to know that this is God in verse in verse 9, it's also in verse 8, it's an aquatic, an aquatic miracle. Again, look at verse 8. And in that day there shall be living waters shall flow from, from Jerusalem. Now this is water. I started with this and I got off on a sidetrack. Brother, you, you know how preachers are sometimes. The one water is going to the Dead Sea. The other water is going to the Mediterranean Sea. Okay? And, and that water is going to be a living water that's going to, to literally give water to all the people who come to Jerusalem to worship God. It's going to flow right by Jerusalem and go right into Jerusalem and go right out to the Mediterranean Sea. Beautiful, beautiful. It's going to water that whole area. In verse 9, we see the, oh, by the way, did you know I was reading the other day and I was reading about the Temple Mount area and then several years ago they had a problem. They had water seeping up through the ground and didn't know where it was coming from. And so they were trying, they thought it was the Jews, the Arabs thought it was the Jews trying to wreck the, the Temple Mount area. So they began digging underneath to find out a lot of the problem, what was going on. And if you'll notice, there was a buckle in the wall that was about ready to cave in because of all this water. And they had to push stuff up against it to stop it from caving in. But they couldn't stop the water from going. Now they've got it, got it contained, so to speak, they think. But this water was coming up. Where was it coming from? They had no clue. I tell you what it's, where it's coming from. It's getting ready to come out. That river is getting ready to flow. Folks, years and years and years ago, I remember reading that they were going to build a, a hotel on top of the Mount of Olives, but they chose not to build it there. They built it in another location because there was a seismic problem in the, in the mountain because there was a fissure there and they didn't want it to, to have an earthquake and split the hotel up. These things are unbelievable, folks. Anyway, Jesus is going to come back. We see in, in verse 9 the investiture of the Lord. And the Lord shall be king over all the earth. Didn't say will be or could be or maybe be. Will be, shall be, it says here. Shall be king over all the earth. We notice here the sovereignty of Christ. He's not going to just come back for the Jewish nation and be king. He's not going to just come back and be the king over, over a few countries there in the Middle East. The Bible says the entire world. And you and I get to come back with him and rule and reign with him as his bride. That's the reward you and I have been given for serving him. Preachers and deacons and Sunday school teachers and soul winners and people who are expecting his coming, who are living for him, who are witnessing and doing all the things that Christ told us to do before he come back. Beloved, you and I are going to rule and reign with him for a thousand years. All over the earth. He's going to say to me, John, there's a problem down in Sao Paulo. Get to it. I'll say, yes, sir. And in a moment, in a thought, I'll be there. I won't have to get on Delta. I won't have to go through Atlanta. Amen, Amen I tell you. <laughs> nothing personal about Georgia. Trust me. It's just Atlanta is, airport is... Some Yankee must have developed that. It had to be. But the bottom, amen. The bottom line is, folks, we're going to be working with Jesus in that time. But he's going to come and he's going to rule all over the earth. We see his supremacy, his, pro, his supremacy of Christ. Finally, truly, a divine one world leader. Again, look at verse 9. The Bible says, And the Lord shall be king over all the earth. In that day it shall be the Lord is one and his name one. We're going to have a truly divine one world leader, Jesus. Folks, Satan is going to lose. Amen. Do you know I met a Satanist years ago? I'm just curious, playing ping pong with her. You know, and all that good stuff. And 
We were talking. I said, Chris, let me talk to you about Jesus. Don't want to hear it. Why not? Well, I'm a Satanist. I thought, oh, never had that one before. So I said, let's talk about it. She says, you think this Jesus is going to come back. And we know that he is. But we believe that Satan is going to overthrow him. And when he overthrows him, we're going to have the world. And we're going to open up the gate. We're going to get the keys back and we're going to open up the gates of hell and let out all the people and we're going to have this world for ourselves. And I said, good luck with that one. My Bible doesn't say it that way, does it? My Bible says Christ is going to be the ruler. My Bible says Christ is going to be supreme. Satan will lose, praise God. And you and I will rule and reign with him. I don't know what city I'm going to get. Maybe I'll get a little city. Well, I don't know. Albany's not bad. I like that barbecue place. That might be a nice place. Or even Fitzgerald. What's it called? Yeah, Nabila's. Yeah, oh yeah. I don't know where I'm going to go, but I do know this. I'll, I will be in love with serving Jesus Amen. perfectly. I'll have a perfect body. I'll have a perfect mind. I'll, I'll be able to serve Jesus with everything I have. Jesus said, if any man come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross daily and follow me. And folks, I've been struggling ever since. And so have you. One day we won't have to struggle anymore. We won't have to fight with that old nature. We won't have to fight with that old man, as Paul says. We're going to be free. We're going to be living for Jesus totally, 100%, without any problem whatsoever. No sin will live in a world that the old world system has been done away with. Satan will be locked up. We're going to have a world that's going to be absolutely like no one else has ever seen in this, in this time. But there'll be one problem. There'll be the old nature and those people that survived. And that's where we're going to come in. We rule and reign with Christ. We're going to be judging. We'll judge the nations. We'll take care of the problems. Again, we see the sovereignty of Christ. Look at verse 10 and 11. The inhabitants of the land. The inhabitants of the land. In verse 10, look at the prominence of the city. All the land shall be turned into a plain from Geba to Ramon, south of Jerusalem. Jerusalem shall be raised up and inhabited in her place from Benjamin's gate to the place of the first gate and the corner gate and from the tower of Hamel to the king's wine presses. The people shall dwell in it and no longer shall there be utter destruction, but Jerusalem shall be safely inhabited. We see here, folks, the prominence of the city. We're all going to go up to Jerusalem. Jerusalem is, is a beautiful city. Some of you have been there. It's on several hills, and it's a gorgeous, beautiful city. But the Bible says it's going to be raised up, literally, literally. And I believe it will be literally raised up so that everyone will see and say, we're going to go up to Jerusalem. Well, they say it in the Bible now. If you look at your Bible, they talk about we're going up to Jerusalem because that's what you did, but we're really going to go up to Jerusalem. I don't know how high it'll be, but it'll be, it'll be the prominent city of the entire world. It'll be the capital of the entire world. Why? Because Jesus is going to be there. You want to see the, what we're going to have like in the, in the, book, of, uh, in the book of Ezekiel? T start with chapter 40, go all the way through. You're going to see the temple. You're going to see how everything's made. It's glorious. It's absolutely wonderful. Jesus is going to sit in the temple and we're going to sing and we're going to bring honor and bring glory to him. We see here the prominence of the city, but look at the protection of its citizens. Jerusalem is not going to be destroyed anymore. Well, one day Jesus remodels the world. I understand that. But this world's not going to be destroyed. It's not going to end. I'm sorry. All these people who you know, say that the world's going to be destroyed, that's not true. The Bible doesn't say that. The Bible says, now Jesus is going to, to make it over. You know, I believe in global warming. I really do. <laughs> The Bible says Jesus is going to burn this place up and I don't know how much warmer you can get globally. <laughs> He's going to burn it up and build it anew. But meanwhile, we're going to serve Him in this city and the citizens will never have to be afraid again. You ever been afraid when you walked outside your house? You ever heard a strange noise? Going to your car, maybe you're downtown somewhere or walking out somewhere, maybe you're in the mall and you're walking out to your car and you hear a strange noise or a strange person kind of comes up to you and you feel kind of scared, don't you? you know, that's why we have locks on our doors. You know, I don't remember ever having a key. You know, talk about these latchkey kids. I don't ever remember having a key to my house until I was later older. You know, I just ran around, did what I want to do. My parents said, be back before dark. And that's elementary school. 
And we had a good time. Folks, it, it, later on, we become fearful. We won't even let our kids play in the front yard, for goodness sake. Won't be that way. The Bible says all the citizens will be safe. And Jerusalem will be a place of safety. This is, that's the first phase of the Battle of Armageddon. Look at, at verses 12 through 15. We see the final phase. Now this is where it's going to get really, really hairy. So bear with me. Okay, bear with me. Look at, look at verse uh, 12 and 13. That's the campaign at Armageddon. And it came to pass in that day that a great panic from the Lord will be among them. Oh, excuse me, let's start with verse 12. I start with 13. I love bifocals. Verse 12, And this shall be the plague with which the Lord will strike all the people who fought against Jerusalem. Their flesh shall dissolve while they stand at their feet, on their feet. Their eyes shall dissolve in their sockets, and their tongues shall dissolve in their mouths. It shall come to pass in that day that a great panic from the Lord will be among them. Everyone will seize the hand of his neighbor and raise his hand against his neighbor's hand. We see here verse 12 and 13, a plague of great devastation. I've had people say, Preacher, do you believe that's, a, that's an atomic bomb? It sounds like one, doesn't it? It doesn't have to be. You see, I, I, it's going to be the Creator who's going to do this. And the same creator who put those atoms and all that stuff together is the same creator who can say, fall apart, and it will. The same creator that spoke and that which was nothing, it was made out of nothing. That which was visible, the book of Hebrews says, nothing was made that was made that was visible. And so what we have here is a God who can just say, no more. And that person just, poof, be no more. Just dissolve like, like something burned him up. Can you imagine that? I can't imagine what that, you know, it's like the earthquake I went through when I was in California. When I was a young man in California, I was out in, the, uh, in, in the maneuvers, and I was out in the boonies, and, and got up that morning, stretched, ate my breakfast, was cleaning my uh, mess kit out in, the, in this big old barrel, and all of a sudden, vroom, everything started rolling back and forth. I never knew anything like that could happen. I'm from Indiana, for goodness sake. We get a little trimmer, but nothing like that. It moved that whole barrel of that hot water and literally tipped it over. I was watching the telephone poles and all the lines in the distance going like this. We had a huge earthquake in L.A. and We were 60 miles from it. It was doing that. It was amazing. This is the same thing. We have a God who can do things that we just have no clue that he can do doesn't mean it's not going to happen. It means that God is in control. We see the retaliation against His adversaries. Again, the same voice that spoke into creation that it would be is now willing to speak and His enemies would be no more. Very simple as that. We see the revenge of His anger in verse 12. The Bible says here that He's going to strike all the people who fought against Jerusalem. Jerusalem is His place. The Jews are his people. There is nothing ever found in the Bible that says that God abandoned his people. The Abrahamic covenant is still in existence. We carry with us some, some doctrines sometimes that were given to us by people who chose to replace the nation of Israel and say that the church replaced Israel. It's not true. It's not true. And God is going to judge these people who have taken His children. Now, beloved, you and I, as Christians, we've been engrafted into that family. We've been put in that tree. Engrafted in that tree, as Paul says. The tree's not dead, folks. God doesn't hate the tree. One day God's going to resurrect that tree. And the Bible says here in Jerusalem, He's going to exact revenge upon them. Every time in Russia they murdered a Jew in the pogroms, God's going to remember it. Those descendants of those Russians who murdered those Jews, He's going to take care of. Every descendant of, of Hitler's people that were willing to kill the Jews are all going to come against the Jews that day. God's going to say, I'm, re I'm exacting revenge on you right now. Folks, the Bible tells us to be not deceived. God is not mocked. 
whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. And folks, that's the judgment God is going to bring upon this Gentile world for how they treated his Jewish people. Now, pastor, are Jewish people lost without Christ? Yes. Yes. Just like my, my own family. I love my family. My children are like your children. They do things I'm not so excited about. And I was one of those children at one time too. But here's the thing. I never stopped loving them. I never stopped wanting to bring them back into my home. I never stopped desiring them to be with me. The Bible describes the Jewish people as the apple of God's eye. And we see here of these people who've come to destroy it. Let's get rid of these Jews, finally and all. Hitler had it right. All these people had it right. Let's kill them all right now. We've got them surrounded. Let's do it. And the Bible says God comes back to exact revenge, the revenge of His anger. Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 30 says, For we know him who said, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. And again, the Lord will judge his people. You know, let me say this, Christian. We don't have to avenge ourselves. Don't, don't get caught up in that. Don't get caught up in hating people and wanting to get back at people when they, when they do things to you or say things to you. I realize the old man is the first thing that wakes up on you when somebody says something ugly to you. I understand that. I understand you'd like to give it back to them. I know all of that stuff. But you know, the Bible says you forgive your enemies. Love your enemies. Why? Because Jesus could save them one day. By your love and your grace that you give them. See, we live in, we live in the time of grace. This is a different time. This is a time when God says, okay, now it's time for vengeance and I'm going to do it. Meanwhile, you and I now forgive. Let it go. Let it go. Vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. I found out a long time ago, he does it better, much better than I could ever do it. You know, some people can be ugly to you, can't they? But here's the deal. The deal is you forgive them and let it go and let Jesus have it. Lord, I I'm, I'm, I'm believe you're going to take care of it. I believe you're going to do it. And he will one day. We see this. Let the Lord deal with it. Let, let us forgive and let go and let God sort it out, huh? In verse 13, we see a panic of grave destruction. And it shall come to pass in that day that a great panic from the Lord will be among them. Everyone will seize the hand of his neighbor and raise his hand against his neighbor's hand. Well, not only are people literally falling apart, but people are fighting one another. We see a great panic break out, an attack of his curse right here. We see in verse 13, the Bible says very simply, and it shall come to pass in a great panic. He's going to curse these people, and these people are going to panic. And the Bible says it's an army of confusion. They're going to just turn on each other. We see not only that, but look in verse 14 and 15, the coalition in Armageddon. This is something very unique that a lot of people don't understand. There's a coalition in this. Have you seen here in this scripture the Lord coming back? And have you seen also in the scriptures the saints coming back? You know, we're going, to, I, you know, I realize that Jesus will be able to say in one, one swoop and, and everybody just fall dead. But it says the saints are going to come back. We're not going to come back and be his cheerleaders, folks. We're going to come back and fight with him. Look again at verse, at verse 14. We see the commission of God's people. The Bible says here, Judah also. We see where it says the saints before. Now it says Judah also will fight at Jerusalem. Now, I don't know how more direct you can be with that. So folks, if Judah is going to fight, and you know Judah is the name for Jews. That's where you get the name Jews from. Judah. And Judah will fight at Jerusalem and the wealth of all the surrounding nations shall be gathered together, gold, silver, silver and apparel in great abundance. We see God's warriors of righteousness. God's army of Armageddon is a threefold confederation. First of all, it's Jesus, the Son of God. And then it's going to be the saints, the bride of Christ, who are going to come back with Jesus, and we're going to fight with Him. And then the third part of the confederation is the Jews. And they're going to fight too. Folks, it's going to be one big brawl. And we're going to fight for Christ. 
We see that God's warriors of righteousness, but look at God's wages of retribution. Most likely all this gold and silver and precious jewels and everything is going to be all that was taken from them in, in the 14th chapter, verse 2. We're going to go back and reclaim what was there. You know, right now in Jerusalem, there is a six-foot-tall, solid gold menorah. Now, I don't know what gold is going for right now, but I'm telling you, a six-foot-tall gold menorah getting ready to be put into the next temple. Folks, that's a lot of money. And they're going to take that like the Romans took it before. And they're going to take all the stuff that the Jewish people have already made to go into the, into the third temple. You know, the Jewish people are building the temple from the inside out. Zola Levitt, the late Zola Levitt, used to say that they were God's interior decorators. That one day they're going to build that temple and they're going to fill it with all this gold and everything. And all the wealth that Israel has is going to be taken from them in that fight in verse 2. But the Bible says they're going to go back and get it back. Get what's theirs. Last we see in verse 15, the completeness of God's plague. You know, as a young person, I always thought, why, why is this all about? Look at verse 15. Such also shall be the plague on the horse and the mule, on the camel and the donkey, and on all the cattle that will be in those camps, so shall this plague be. We see the finality of God's retribution here. God's going to take everything from them. Now, before you call PETA, let me say this. Let me say this. You say, well, how could this be? And I have thought and thought and I've read. Every, no, everybody skirts this. They don't talk about it. But here's what my take in is on it. Okay? The Lord led me to, there in the book of Mark and there in the book of Luke, when Jesus had gone across the, the uh, uh, Sea of Galilee and gone there into the cemetery and met the demoniac, or the, the two of the uh, demon-possessed men of Gadara. And there, remember the demon said, Look, look, are you here to judge us? Well, don't judge us. Let us go in the pigs, which is a commentary in its own. But anyway, let us go in the pigs. And so Jesus says, go. And they left that man, and they went into the pigs, and the pigs took off and ran off the edge and went into the water and drowned. Okay? Perhaps these animals that are with these people, this demonic army of Satan, are demon-possessed themselves. I don't know. I'm only saying this is the only thing I could ever come up with. You know, so don't call Peter. They're, it's okay. We see the fullness of his revenge. Why animals? Perhaps, again, it's demon-possessed. I don't know. Let's turn our Bibles to, to Revelation 19. I really want to go there for just a moment. Revelation chapter 19. I love this picture. I don't know about you, but I love this picture of Jesus. Revelation 19, start with verse 19. The Bible says, And I saw the beast, the kings of the earth, and their armies, gathered together to make war against him who sat on the horse and against his army. What's an army do, folks? Army fights. That's you and I. Then the beast was captured, and with him the false prophet who worked signs in his presence, by which he deceived those who received the mark of the beast and those who worshipped his enemy, image. That's the Nimrod code, isn't it? The worship of the image, the, the idol worship. These two were cast alive into the lake of fire burning with brimstone, and the rest were killed with the sword which proceeded from the mouth of him who sat on the horse, and all the birds were filled with their flesh. Now that's what's going to happen. That's what I originally wanted to go in and talk about, but Zechariah, I think, really gives you an in-depth, real close, you're right there in the valley look. Now, folks, this is real. The kingdoms, the two kingdoms, Satan is going to bring this Nimrod kingdom into, into play and he's going to bring it out to the point that the whole world is going to turn for it and Satan's going to say, aha, I've finally done it. And the people of the world are going to say, we've finally done it. God can't mess with us now. But they forgot to read Daniel. 
And they forgot to read Daniel 2. When that stone comes flying out of the sky and comes and smacks that statue right on the feet and destroys it and crumbles it. And folks, that's the picture of Jesus coming back that Zechariah shows us. You and I are going to come back with perfect bodies. You and I are going to be taken out of this old world so that we don't have to suffer with the people here today. One person said, how can you be sure? And I asked them this. If you were a bride and your bridegroom said to you the night before your wedding, I love you so much, I just want to beat the devil out of you. I want to just knock you around and make you look black and blue, and then we'll get together and marry you tomorrow. Wouldn't that be sweet? I got one word for a, for a bride like that. Run. And you would too. Why would Jesus want to beat up his bride? And, and I've had people say, well, who are we? The early Christians suffered. Who are we that we should... We, 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 that we should not suffer. Folks, you tell the people in Indonesia they're not suffering enough for Jesus. You tell the people in China that they're not suffering enough for Jesus. You tell the people in Africa and in India and Indonesia and all the places all over the world that, that are without Christ, they're not suffering enough for Jesus. Folks, the church is suffering. Amen. One day we're going to be taken out of all of this. But here's the thing, folks. Only those who are born-again Christians are going to go. The church. There are going to be some people left behind right here. They'll be here the Sunday afterwards. They'll come down this aisle and say, Where, where's everybody at? They'll be down the church down the street. They'll be down the church around the corner. They'll say, what's going on? Hopefully it's not our family. Hopefully it's not our friends. Hopefully it's not our children. Oh, it, it, it just, I've got now two grandchildren to worry about. All my kids are saved. Now I've got two grandchildren to worry about. And I pray for them daily. Oh, Lord, let them come to an early knowledge of Christ. And we tell them all about Jesus every day that we can, every opportunity we have, so their little hearts can grasp the things of Jesus. Oh, folks, we've, we've got a lot of work to do before Jesus comes back. Don't think with a bunker mentality that you can crawl in a hole somewhere and wait for Jesus and everything will be okay. I'm glad somebody told me about Jesus. Amen. Folks, you've got neighbors, we got friends, we got family members, work associates that need Jesus. They need to come down this aisle and receive Christ. They need to be taught about Jesus. They need to be saved in their homes. They need to be saved at work. Whatever, folks, we need to be busy before Jesus comes back. Amen. Let me challenge you today as a church. This is a good church. Your pastor tells me all the time, I have a good church. The people are so good. He says, I love them and they love me. And he says, it's a wonderful opportunity. But oh, folks, we've got to take that same love and go out into highways and byways and compel people to come in. Well, they won't come. We'll go, go find somebody else. Tell them about Jesus. Church isn't just about singing and hoping and, pr and praying and, and, and doing all these things. It's about people getting saved right. before it's too late. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for this time you've given us. And Father, I thank you for this sweet church and the people who've gathered so long in this conference have come faithfully being here night after night. And Father, I thank you and I praise you. They desire not to see me, but to open the word and learn the truth of God's word. And Father, as we have gathered here tonight, let no one leave this place that is lost. Jesus is coming soon, Father, and we must be busy about your work. We must be busy about the master's work, going to and fro, giving money to missions, going out and reaching people so that missionaries can be fed, missionaries can get the word out, that we ourselves can be missionaries right here in Tifton. Oh, Father God, speak to hearts tonight. Convict us of our needs. Oh, Father God, give us strength to do what you would have us to do and be the man, the woman, the young man, the young woman that we need to be. Oh, Father, before we leave this place tonight, let hearts be changed. Let those who need to be saved be saved. Let those, Father, who need to pray, come and pray. Those who need to join a church, join the church. Whatever decision, Father, let our hearts be made anew that as we leave this place, we'll be ready for your coming. 
For it is in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Hi, my name is John Blair, and I have the privilege of being the pastor here at Coventry Baptist Church in Fort Wayne, Indiana. I want to thank you for choosing to take part in our online services. I sincerely hope they were a blessing to you, and I want to invite you to continue to use them in the weeks yet ahead. In fact, take your time on our website, check it out, let us know what you think about it. Your opinion is very important to us and we'd like to have some feedback. Let me take this time to also extend an invitation to you. If you don't already have a church home, let me invite you to come to our church and take part in one of our weekly services. Our morning worship service on Sunday is at 10 a.m. Our Sunday night service is at 6 p.m. And our Wednesday services and our midweek service is at 7 o'clock p.m. We're located at 10926 Aboit Center Road. We're right across the street from Homestead High School. Uh, just get on our website. We have a detailed map and some instructions on how to get here. Again, thank you for choosing our website and our services. I pray that the Lord will bless you and keep you. I hope to see you this Sunday.